At this point, we've looked at a very wide variety of biomes, ranging from tundra to tropical rainforest, to desert to coral reefs to the bottom of the ocean. And in this last section, we're going to turn our attention to variety in living organisms because there truly is an extraordinary range of forms and adaptations that living organisms take on. Here on this slide are a few examples to give you a sense of that range. Our malaria ostoyae is a type of fungus, a mushroom um, that may appear small to us. It's one pictured on the left-hand side, but is actually enormous because most of the fungus grows underground. And there's a specimen in Oregon that is debated to be the largest living organism on the planet. On the surface, it looks like these scant patches of mushrooms, but underground, they are all connected over an area of 3.7 miles and weigh an estimated 35,000 tons. Another organism that represents the wide diversity of life is the tardigrade, also known as the water bear. So these are microscopic animals. They're this one's pictured in the middle, um, and they have an incredible hardiness to extreme conditions that has been well documented. They can survive in temperatures as low as negative 273 degrees Celsius and as high as 150 degrees Celsius. And then uh, far right is the Mariana snailfish. It was discovered in and named for the ocean's deepest trench, the Mariana Trench, where it lives at a depth of over 8,000 meters where the ocean can exert a pressure that is 300 times greater than atmospheric pressure. So as you can see, um, living organisms occupy a huge range of hab habitats. Um, they have a huge range of adaptations and characteristics. And that range is more or less what we refer to as biodiversity. But before we talk about biodiversity, we need to introduce a little bit about the characteristics of living organisms and how they are classified. So all life on Earth is either unicellular or multicellular. Unicellular organisms consist of just one cell, and they're therefore simpler in structure. Um, multicellular organisms consist of more than one cell and are therefore more complex in structure. However, the simplicity of unicellular organisms gives them an advantage which is the ability to adapt to some of the most extreme environments on Earth. So single-celled microbes are known to live in the polar ice caps, around deep sea hydrothermal vents, within saline lakes that have salt levels so high that other types of organisms can't survive in them, um, and in geysers and hot springs. And uh, on the other hand, multicellular organisms contain specialized tissues and organs which allows opportunities for adaptations to evolve that would not be possible in single-celled organisms. Um, we also know that multicellular life, multicellular life emerged a couple billion years later than unicellular organisms. And so because evolution takes place at such a slow pace, multicellular organisms haven't had as much time available to them to adapt to the most extreme environments compared to unicellular organisms. And because they've been around so long, there's a lot more diversity within unicellular life. It may sound surprising, but most species on Earth are unicellular. Multicellular organisms might be more familiar to us because they're not microscopic. We can see them, we can interact with them. But in terms of species diversity, they are less abundant than um, the unicellular species. To give you a sense of this difference in diversity and abundance, we can look at how unicellular and multicellular organisms are positioned in the tree of life. So within this figure, multicellular life is entirely encompassed within the blue box. Every other branch is unicellular, unicellular microbes. Um, the, big, the three big terms that you see at the top, um, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, these are categories um, that are called the three domains of life. And these domains are distinguished from each other based on both their physical characteristics and their genetics. So for example, the domains bacteria and archaea are both entirely consistent of single-celled microscopic organisms. But bacteria and archaea are so different from each other on a DNA level that they are divided into two wholly separate domains in the tree of life. And then within the branch eukarya, most organisms are actually single-celled as well. Only the animals, fungi, plants, and at least um, at some stages of their lives, slime molds 
are multicellular. So this gives you some sense of different levels of diversity across the tree of life, but really we don't have a full and complete grasp on that diversity because every species on Earth has not been identified, not by a long shot. Scientists estimate that only 13% of species within the domain Eukarya have been identified, and there's even more uncertainty about what percentage of bacteria and archaea have been characterized because they're microscopic and more difficult to identify and to study. This table here shows a comparison between the number of species of each type that have been described versus how many are predicted to be out there but not yet identified. And the way that scientists make these predictions is by taking a group of organisms that has been very thoroughly studied, like insects, for example, and counting the number of species identified in different zones on Earth, and then coming up with a ratio of how many species exist from zone to zone. And then they use that ratio to make predictions about how many species there are of other groups of organisms that haven't been as extensively studied. So as you can see, for one example, um, over a million different animal species have been described, but different scientists estimate that somewhere between 6.8 and 10.8 million different animals are out there. So the bottom line is there's a lot of biodiversity out there that we know about, um, but there's also a lot of biodiversity that we don't know about because it hasn't been identified yet. Okay, so this finally brings us to the question of what is biodiversity and how do we measure it? So as we defined earlier in the chapter, biodiversity refers to the number of different species of organisms present in a biome. And traditionally, biodiversity has been measured in terms of relative abundance which includes the number of species and the number of individuals of each species in an ecosystem. So if we take the example shown in the illustrations on the right, both of these communities have the same number of species of trees. There's four different trees in each area. However, community number two on the bottom, in this community, 80% of the trees are of a single species. Whereas in community number one on the top, the four species are evenly distributed. So that means community number one has a higher relative abundance of each species and is therefore more biodiverse. But today, um, relative abundance is only one tool that's being used to measure diversity. And there are other measurements that are being used to assess biodiversity in different ways, including genetic diversity and ecosystem diversity. Genetic diversity refers to the variety of genes present in a population. And this is something that scientists didn't used to be able to assess, but now we have gene sequencing technology that allows us to look at how much variety exists within the genetics of a species. And this is significant because DNA is the raw material that undergoes evolution, and greater genetic diversity reflects on the capacity that a species has to adapt to changing system, uh, ecosystems and, and the conditions um, in those ecosystems. So a real life example that shows the principles of genetic diversity is embodied in northern elephant seals um, pictured here. So the northern elephant seal used to occupy the Pacific coastal regions of North America, all the way from Baja California in Mexico up to northern California in the US. And then in the 1800s, the elephant seal was hunted to near extinction by humans. And um, in fact, it was actually declared extinct at the end of the 1800s, but most people didn't realize that there was a small colony of 20 to 40 seals on an island off the coast of Mexico called Guadalupe Island, um, and that colony had survived. And over the past 50 years, with protections um, having been established for elephant seals in both the US and Mexico, the population has recovered to several hundred thousand seals. But 100% of those several hundred thousand seals are the descendants of those 20 to 40 individuals who survived the mass hunting um, on Guadalupe Island and went overlooked. So the species today has very little genetic diversity. Many of the traits that varied across the species um, were lost when the population was reduced to such a small size. So Imagine if like the entire human population was, was reduced to just 20 to 40 individuals on an island, and then the world was repopulated by them. So many traits and so much diversity would be lost, and 
with that diversity, there's a loss of species robustness to adapt in the face of changes. We talked about this when we looked at monoculture back in the agriculture chapter as well. When you raise only one variety of crop, if that particular variety is susceptible to certain diseases or susceptible to drought, then you're in trouble. Other varieties may represent pools of genetic diversity that have disease resistance or drought tolerance, but by losing those varieties, there's also a loss in opportunity for adaptation. So that's genetic diversity. Then ecosystem diversity refers to the number of different ecosystems in the biosphere um, or in a particular region of the biosphere. And this is significant because ecosystems represent spaces where unique species interactions take place. And those species interactions can be quite beneficial. So one example of an ecosystem that is almost completely extinct in the United States is tall grass prairie. Um, tall grass prairie used to cover um, millions, uh, dozens of millions of acres in, in the North American continent, um, which is 230,000 square miles, um, the equivalent. And you can see the historic range of different types of prairie in uh, the US alone. It also extended up into Canada as well. Um, but this is what the, the range of the prairie ecosystems used to look like on that map that you can see there. And today, the National Park Service estimates that less than 4% of tall grass prairie remains intact. And most of it is located in one consolidated region called the Flint Hills in Kansas and Oklahoma. But historically, um, the prairie was a flourishing and highly productive ecosystem where large grazing mammals, um, namely bison, would graze and enrich the soil with their droppings. And the decomposition of the dense grasses also would contribute nutrients. And the consequence was an incredibly rich topsoil that U.S. farmers benefited from for a long time. Um, but now agriculture has moved in, destroyed almost all of the tall grass prairie, and in the process tilled away much of that rich topsoil. One study estimates that almost 58 billion tons of fertile topsoil have been eroded by agriculture in the Midwest. And that topsoil is never coming back because the ecosystem that created it, the tall grass prairie and the bison and all the, the grasses, it's, it's gone. So as humans, we no longer get to benefit from it. A little later in this section, we will talk about some other benefits that humans derive from biodiversity. But first, we need to talk about some trends and patterns in biodiversity across the globe. One of the fields of study that provides us with knowledge about trends in biodiversity is biogeography. Biogeography is the study of the distribution of the world species in both the past and the present. One of the biggest trends in biodiversity that we have learned from biogeography is that biodiversity is highest at the equator and it decreases as you move closer to each of the poles. One example where you can see this manifested is in a comparison between two aquatic ecosystems in different parts of the world, Lake Victoria, which is a lake in eastern central Africa, and Lake Huron, which is one of the Great Lakes in North America. Both of these are quite large lakes. As you can see, both can be clearly seen from space in satellite imagery. Um, lake Victoria is 26,000 square miles in area, and Lake Huron is 23,000 square miles in area, so somewhat similar in size, but very different in biodiversity. So historically, Lake Victoria contained over 500 species of cichlids, which is just a single family of fish, which were native to the lake. Um, in the 1950s, another predatory fish called the Nile perch was introduced to the lake so that humans could fish it as a food source, which led to mass extinction of the cichlids. But prior to this, the lake was extremely biodiverse and contained many unique species that weren't found anywhere else in the world. In contrast, Lake Huron contains only 79 total species of fish, none of which are unique to the lake. They're found in many other lakes in North America. So um, relatively similar sized lakes, very different biodiversity. What accounts for the difference? Well, one major difference is that the geography of these two lakes relative to the equator is very different. Um, Lake Victoria is literally intersected by the equator, which is shown here in this yellow line. Um, so it's located in a tropical zone whereas Lake Huron is located some distance from the equator in a temperate zone. And these lakes embody just one example of the general trend. The tropics are more biodiverse 
and temperate regions are less biodiverse, especially as you get further and further north and south. Scientists have several hypotheses as to why this is the case. One of them has to do with the fact that tropical ecosystems are older than temperate ecosystems. They have existed in their current state for longer. And that's because 20,000 years ago, the temperate zones of North America were covered in sheet ice, um, which means there was no ecosystem there at all, just ice. So the tropics have had a longer um, time for development, which means that they have had um, a longer period of time and more opportunities for speciation, which is the evolutionary process of new species emerging. Another hypothesis has to do with the fact that tropical ecosystems receive more insulation than temperate ecosystems. We talked previously in our climate chapter about how equatorial regions get more direct sunlight. It's not entirely clear how this would translate into a larger number of species, but it may be the case that with more sunlight, more producers, meaning plants, can be supported, and that creates more complexity in ecosystems with more different habitat niches that organisms can evolve and adapt to. And then finally, the third hypothesis has to do with the fact that tropical ecosystems have more stable climate conditions than temperate ecosystems. So regions in the tropics have less variation in diurnal temperatures, meaning um, the low temperatures and high temperatures aren't as far apart. They also have less variation in temperature between seasons, meaning their summer temperatures and winter temperatures are closer together. And also the length of day versus night doesn't change as dramatically throughout the year. So it may be the case that those conditions create the kind of stability that's needed for robust speciation and the evolution of biodiversity. One other feature of biodiversity in the tropics is that they have a higher number of endemic species. So endemic species are species that are native to and only found in one location. Um, the area to which they are endemic can be very large or very small. So for example, blue jays are endemic to North America. You'll find them pretty much anywhere east of the Rockies, which is a huge habitat range, but you won't find them on other continents. On the other hand, the Kito Bakito desert pupfish is endemic to just a few springs and ponds in Oregon Pipe National Monument in southern Arizona, totaling an area of about four square miles. So unsurprisingly, the Kito Bakito pupfish is considered endangered because it has such a restricted habitat, so it is highly vulnerable to extinction. And this transitions us nicely into the next topic on our agenda, which is biodiversity loss. The Earth is experiencing a loss in biodiversity. Biodiversity loss is the term used to describe a decline in biodiversity resulting from the displacement or extinction of species. And to be clear, some level of biodiversity loss happens all the time. It's inevitable. Um, the background extinction rate is the term that's used to describe the natural rate at which species go extinct without the influence of human activity. And we know what a normal background extinction rate is by looking at the fossil record, which can tell us how many species disappear over a particular period of time. And that rate is about one to five species per million species on Earth every year. However, the current extinction rate is about 100 times faster than the background rate. And this means that during the lifespan of the average person in the US, 23,000 species will go extinct. This is a very dramatic number, um, and it's absolutely reason for concern. Conservation agencies within the US and across countries of the world are keeping track of species that are at risk for extinction so that interventions can be made before it's too late. And there's a classification system used by an organization called the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, which categorizes each species based on how urgent the level of concern is for its continued existence. On one end of the IUNC classification spectrum is organisms that are already extinct. So this means organisms that no longer exist anywhere in the world, not in the wild, not in captivity, not anywhere. A prominent example of an extinct species is the Tasmanian tiger, which was native to Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea. And it went extinct in 1936 when the last known member of its kind died at a zoo in Australia. One small step down from that category um, is extinct in the wild. 
These are species that no longer exist in their natural habitat, but still exist in captivity or through human intervention. One example of an animal in this category is Spix's macaw, which is a parrot that was native to Brazil and has been considered extinct in the wild since 2019. Although there are still some birds being cared for by conservation organizations or zoos and efforts are being made to try to reintroduce them to the wild. Then there's a the category critically endangered. These are species that are facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. Their populations are declining rapidly and urgent, conser urgent conservation measures are needed to protect them um, and prevent them from becoming extinct. The Albany cycad, um, a plant that is endemic to the Eastern Cape region of South Africa is in this critically endangered category. This species only has 70, 70 individual plants left as of July, 2023 according to the IUCN. Um, this might look like your run-of-the-mill palm tree, but it is not. It's not a palm tree at all. It's actually more closely related to a pine tree, and it produces seeds in cones. Um, these cycads are a very ancient organism. Their fossils go back through many geological periods, but today many species, including this one, are almost extinct. And then the next category is endangered. Uh, this includes species that are facing a very high risk of extinction in the near future. They have declining populations and are at a significant risk of disappearing if threats are not addressed. An example of a species that's categorized as endangered is the Iberian lynx, which is endemic to Portugal and Spain. The Iberian lynx lost about 80% of its habitat range between 1960 and 2000. Um, and as of July 2023, there are only an estimated 156 individual Iberian lynxes left in the wild. Next category is vulnerable. These are species that are facing a high risk of extinction in the medium term future. Their numbers aren't as low as endangered or critically endangered species, but they are still at risk and require conservation. Snow leopards, which are native to the Himalayas, are classified as vulnerable. They have somewhere in the range of 3,000 individuals left on Earth. Near threatened is the next category. This includes species that are close to qualifying for a threatened category, but they're not yet considered threatened. However, their populations may be in decline and they may be facing threats in the future. So an example of an organism in this category is the serpentine sunflower, which is endemic to California and Oregon, and it has an estimated habitat range of only 160 square kilometers mostly in mountainous areas that are at risk for climate change. Uh, conservation dependent species are ones that are considered low risk, but they are dependent on conservation efforts to prevent them from becoming threatened. One example of an organism in this category is the black caiman, which is a crocodile endemic to South America, which is now considered to be at low risk. They were classified as endangered in the 1970s because Humans were over hunting them to make crocodile leather, but since then the species has rebounded once that overhunting declined. And lastly, there is this category, uh, least concern. This includes species with very low risks. They're not likely to be threatened in the future. Pigeons are an example of a creature in this category, probably to no one's surprise, if you spent any time in a major city in America in recent years, you can probably see that pigeons are doing just fine for themselves. So these are the categories and some examples of organisms in each category, but to give you a more comprehensive picture of the state of affairs in biodiversity loss, this figure shows you different types of organisms and what proportion of them are classified into each of these eight IUNC categories. I won't go into too much detail elaborating on this, but just to orient you, the color code is at the top. So it shows EW means extinct in the wild, CR means critically endangered, EN means endangered, etc. And the larger proportion of red you see for a category, the worse off this group of organisms is. And these have been roughly ordered from best off at the top to worst off at the bottom. You can see that cycads are really on the margins. Amphibians aren't doing well either. Um, I encourage you to pause the video and take a closer look at this figure to get a sense of what the conservation status looks like for these different groups. But our final topic for this lecture, um, we're gonna talk briefly about why you should care. Why does it matter that biodiversity loss is happening? Um, in what ways do 
humans benefit from a biodiverse world and what do we stand to lose? So one benefit we derive from biodiversity is health, specifically medicine, because many medicines are based on compounds that are derived from living organisms. Some examples include aspirin, codeine, artemisinin, which is a drug that's used to treat malaria, and chemotherapeutic agents that are used to treat cancer. The top photo here is of the Madagascar periwinkle, and the bottom photo is of Pacific U, and both of these are sources of cancer treatment drugs. And the right photo is of sweet wormwood, which is the source of artemisinin. Another benefit we derive from biodiversity is agriculture. While our agriculture may be a quote unquote artificial man made endeavor, it's facilitated and supported by wild ecosystems that supply pollinators, that cycle nutrients in the soil, um, provide sources of natural pest control. And without these elements of the broader ecosystem, agriculture would not be possible. And additionally, as the climate changes and farmers face new challenges in raising crops under different conditions, it's important to main maintain crop diversity so that there are available opportunities to develop new crop varieties or improve current ones through genetic modification. So seed banks have for many years been attempting to preserve that diversity by collecting and storing seeds. The Svalbard Global Seed Vault um, is the largest example of this. It's located in the northern part of Norway above the Arctic, cir Arctic Circle, and there it is cold enough for the seeds to remain dormant and preserved. And um, the vaults have enough space to store 4.5 million seed samples, although they are nowhere near that full yet. The third and final major benefit of biodiversity is the provision of wild food sources from diverse ecosystems. So we may think of our food as coming from farms or ranches that raise domesticated livestock, but wild populations um, of fish especially serve as a major food source for a large portion of the human population. Fish farms are um, also a source of fish, but about half of fish are still wild caught. So maintaining robust aquatic ecosystems supports the sustainability of fisheries, um, such as this ocean fishery that you see pictured here, and their role as a food source for humans.